Rescue Party, first published in Astounding Science Fiction, May 1946, collected in Reach for Tomorrow. This story stems from a lost original, which also inspired History Lesson, 1949, although it would be difficult to find two more contrasting endings. Who was to blame? For three days, Alvaron's thoughts had come back to that question, and still he had found no answer. A creature of a less civilized or a less sensitive race would never have let it torture his mind, and would have satisfied himself with the assurance that no one could be responsible for the working of fate. But Alvaron and his kind had been lords of the universe since the dawn of history, since that far distant age when the time barrier had been folded round the cosmos by the unknown powers that lay beyond the beginning. To them had been given all knowledge, and within infinite knowledge went infinite responsibility. If there were mistakes and errors in the administration of the galaxy, the fault lay on the heads of Alvaron and his people. And this was no mere mistake. It was one of the greatest tragedies in history. The crew still knew nothing. Even Rugon, his closest friend and the ship's deputy captain, had been told only part of the truth. But now, the doomed worlds lay less than a billion miles ahead. In a few hours, they would be landing on the third planet. Once again, Alvaron read the message from base. Then, with a flick of a tentacle that no human eye could have followed, he pressed the general attention button. Throughout the mile-long cylinder that was the galactic survey ship S-9000, creatures of many races laid down their work to listen to the words of their captain. I know you have all been wondering, began Alvaron, why we were ordered to abandon our survey and to proceed at such an acceleration to this region of space. Some of you may realize what this acceleration means. Our ship is on its last voyage. The generators have already been running for 60 hours at ultimate overload. We will be very lucky if we return to base under our own power. We are approaching a sun, which is about to become a nova. Detonation will occur in seven hours, with an uncertainty of one hour, leaving us a maximum of only four hours of exploration. There are ten planets in the system about to be destroyed, and there is a civilization on the third. That fact was discovered only a few days ago. It is our tragic mission to contact that doomed race, and if possible, to save some of its members. I know that there is little we can do in so short a time with this single ship. No other machine can possibly reach the system before detonation occurs. There was a long pause during which there could have been no sound or movement in the whole of the mighty ship as it sped silently toward the worlds ahead. Alvaron knew what his companions were thinking, and he tried to answer their unspoken question. You will wonder how such a disaster, the greatest of which we have any record, has been allowed to occur. On one point, I can assure you, the fault does not lie with the survey. As you know, with our present fleet of under 12,000 ships, it is possible to re-examine each of the 8,000 million solar systems in the galaxy at intervals of about a million years. Most worlds change very little in so short a time as that. Less than 400,000 years ago, the survey ship S-5060 examined the planets of the system we are approaching. It found intelligence on none of them, though the third planet was teeming with animal life and two other worlds had once been inhabited. The usual report was submitted and the system is due for its next examination in 600,000 years. It now appears that in the incredibly short period since the last survey, intelligent life has appeared in the system. The first intimation of this occurred when unknown radio signals were detected on the planet Kulath in the system X29.35, Y34.76, Z27.93. Bearings were taken on them. They were coming from the system ahead. Kulath is 200 light years from here, so those radio waves had been on their way for two centuries. Thus, 
for at least that period of time a civilization has existed on one of these worlds, a civilization that can generate electromagnetic waves and all that that implies. An immediate telescopic examination of the system was made, and it was then found that the sun was in the unstable pre-Nova stage. Detonation might occur at any moment, and indeed might have done so, while the light waves were on their way to Kulath. There was a slight delay while the supervelocity scanners on Kulath II were focused onto the system. They showed that the explosion had not yet occurred, but was only a few hours away. If Kulath had been a fraction of a light year further from this sun, we should never have known of its civilization until it had ceased to exist. The administrator of Kulath contacted Sector Base immediately, and I was ordered to proceed to the system at once. Our object is to save what members we can of the doomed race, if indeed there are any left. But we have assumed that a civilization possessing radio could have protected itself against any rise of temperature that may have already occurred. This ship and two tenders will each explore a section of the planet. Commander Torkali will take number one, Commander Arostron number two. They will have just under four hours in which to explore this world. At the end of that time, they must be back in the ship. It will be leaving then, with or without them. I will give the two commanders detailed instructions in the control room immediately. That is all. We enter atmosphere in two hours. On the world once known as Earth, the fires were dying out. There was nothing left to burn. The great forests that had swept across the planet like a tidal wave with the passing of the cities were now no more than glowing charcoal, and the smoke of their funeral pyres still stained the sky. But the last hours were still to come, for the surface rocks had not yet begun to flow. The continents were dimly visible through the haze, but their outlines meant nothing to the watchers in the approaching ship. The charts they possessed were out of date by a dozen ice ages and more deluges than one. The S-9000 had driven past Jupiter and seen at once that no life could exist in those half-gaseous oceans of compressed hydrocarbons, now erupting furiously under the sun's abnormal heat. Mars and the outer planets they had missed, and Alvaron realized that the worlds nearer the sun than Earth would be already melting. It was more than likely, he thought sadly, that the tragedy of this unknown race was already finished. Deep in his heart, he thought it might be better so. The ship could only have carried a few hundred survivors, and the problem of selection had been haunting his mind. Rugon, chief of communications and deputy captain, came into the control room. For the last hour, he had been striving to detect radiation from Earth, but in vain. We're too late, he announced gloomily. I've monitored the whole spectrum, and the ether's dead except for our own stations and some 200-year-old programs from Kulath. Nothing in this system is radiating anymore. He moved toward the giant vision screen with a graceful flowing motion that no mere biped could ever hope to imitate. Alvaron said nothing. He had been expecting this news. One entire wall of the control room was taken up by the screen, a great black rectangle that gave an impression of almost infinite depth. Three of Rugon's slender control tentacles, useless for heavy work but incredibly swift at all manipulation, flickered over the selector dials and the screen lit up with a thousand points of light. The star field flowed swiftly past as Rugon adjusted the controls, bringing the projector to bear upon the sun itself. No man of Earth would have recognized the monstrous shape that filled the screen. The sun's light was white no longer. Great violet-blue clouds covered half its surface, and from them long streamers of flame were erupting into space. At one point, an enormous prominence had reared itself out of the photosphere, far out even into the flickering veils of the corona. It was as though a tree of fire had taken root in the surface of the sun, a tree that stood half a million miles high and whose branches were rivers of flame sweeping through space at hundreds of miles a second. 
I suppose, said Rugon presently, that you are quite satisfied about the astronomer's calculations. After all, oh, we're perfectly safe, said Alvaron confidently. I've spoken to Kulath Observatory, and they have been making some additional checks through our own instruments. That uncertainty of an hour includes a private safety margin which they won't tell me in case I feel tempted to stay any longer. He glanced at the instrument board. The pilot should have brought us to the atmosphere now. Switch the screen back to the planet, please. Ah, there they go. There was a sudden tremor underfoot and a raucous clanging of alarms instantly stilled. Across the vision screen, two slim projectiles dived toward the looming mass of Earth. For a few miles they traveled together, then they separated, one vanishing abruptly as it entered the shadow of the planet. Slowly the huge mothership, with its thousand times greater mass, descended after them into the raging storms that already were tearing down the deserted cities of man. It was night in the hemisphere over which Arostran drove his tiny command. Like Torkali, his mission was to photograph and record, and to report progress to the mother ship. The little scout had no room for specimens or passengers. If contact was made with the inhabitants of this world, the S-9000 would come at once. There would be no time for parlaying. If there was any trouble, the rescue would be by force, and the explanations could come later. The ruined land beneath was bathed with an eerie, flickering light, for a great auroral display was raging over half the world. But the image on the vision screen was independent of external light, and it showed clearly a waste of barren rock that seemed never to have known any form of life. Presumably this desert land must come to an end somewhere. Orostran increased his speed to the highest value he dared risk in so dense an atmosphere. The machine fled on through the storm, and presently the desert of rock began to climb toward the sky. A great mountain range lay ahead, its peaks lost in the smoke-laden clouds. Arostran directed the scanners toward the horizon, and on the vision screen the line of mountains seemed suddenly very close and menacing. He started to climb rapidly. It was difficult to imagine a more unpromising land in which to find civilization, and he wondered if it would be wise to change course. He decided against it. Five minutes later, he had his reward. Miles below lay a decapitated mountain, the whole of its summit sheared away by some tremendous feat of engineering. Rising out of the rock and straddling the artificial plateau was an intricate structure of metal girders supporting masses of machinery. Arostran brought his ship to a halt and spiraled down toward the mountain. The slight Doppler blur had now vanished and the picture on the screen was clear-cut. The latticework was supporting some scores of great metal mirrors pointing skyward at an angle of 45 degrees to the horizontal. They were slightly concave, and each had some complicated mechanism at its focus. There seemed something impressive and purposeful about the great array. Every mirror was aimed at precisely the same spot in the sky, or beyond. Arostran turned to his colleagues. It looks like some kind of observatory to me, he said. Have you ever seen anything like it before? Clarton, a multi-tentacled tripedal creature from a globular cluster at the edge of the Milky Way, had a different theory. That's communication equipment. Those reflectors are for focusing electromagnetic beams. I've seen the same kind of installation on a hundred worlds before. It may even be the station that Kulath picked up, though that's rather unlikely, for the beams would be very narrow from mirrors that size. That would explain why Rugon could detect no radiation before we landed, added Hanser too, one of the twin beings from the planet Thargon. Arostran did not agree at all. If that is a radio station, it must be built for interplanetary communication. Look at the way the mirrors are pointed. I don't believe that a race which has only had radio for two centuries can have crossed space. It took my people 6,000 years to do it.
We managed it in three, said Hanser, too, mildly, speaking a few seconds ahead of his twin. Before the inevitable argument could develop, Clarton began to wave his tentacles with excitement. While the others had been talking, he had started the automatic monitor. Here it is. Listen. He threw a switch, and the little room was filled with a raucous whining sound, continually changing in pitch, but nevertheless retaining certain characteristics that were difficult to define. The four explorers listened intently for a minute. Then Rostron said, Surely that can't be any form of speech. No creature could produce sounds as quickly as that. Hanser One had come to the same conclusion. That's a television program. Don't you think so, Clarton? The other agreed. Yes, and each of those mirrors seems to be radiating a different program. I wonder where they're going. If I'm correct, one of the other planets in the system must lie along those beams. We can soon check that. Arostran called the S-9000 and reported the discovery. Both Rugon and Alvaron were greatly excited and made a quick check of the astronomical records. The result was surprising and disappointing. None of the other nine planets lay anywhere near the line of transmission. The great mirrors appeared to be pointing blindly into space. There seemed only one conclusion to be drawn, and Clarton was the first to voice it. They had interplanetary communication, he said. But the station must be deserted now, and the transmitters no longer controlled. They haven't been switched off and are just pointing where they were left. Well, we'll soon find out, said Arostron. I'm going to land. He brought the machine slowly down to the level of the great metal mirrors and passed them until it came to rest on the mountain rock. A hundred yards away, a white stone building crouched beneath the maze of steel girders. It was windowless, but there were several doors in the wall facing them. Arostron watched his companions climb into their protective suits and wished he could follow. But someone had to stay in the machine to keep in touch with the mother ship. Those were Alvaron's instructions, and they were very wise. One never knew what would happen on a world that was being explored for the first time, especially under conditions such as these. Very cautiously, the three explorers stepped out of the airlock and adjusted the anti-gravity field of their suits. Then, each with the mode of locomotion peculiar to his race, the little party went toward the building, the Hanser twins leading and Clarton following close behind. His gravity control was apparently giving trouble, for he suddenly fell to the ground, rather to the amusement of his colleagues. Arostron saw them pause for a moment at the nearest door. Then it opened slowly, and they disappeared from sight. So Arostron waited, with what patience he could, while the storm rose around him and the light of the aurora grew even brighter in the sky. At the agreed times, he called the mother ship and received brief acknowledgments from Rugon. He wondered how Torkali was faring, halfway around the planet, but he could not contact him through the crash and thunder of solar interference. It did not take Clarton and the Hansers long to discover that their theories were largely correct. The building was a radio station, and it was utterly deserted. It consisted of one tremendous room with a few small offices leading from it. In the main chamber, row after row of electrical equipment stretched into the distance. Lights flickered and winked on hundreds of control panels, and a dull glow came from the elements in a great avenue of vacuum tubes. But Clarton was not impressed. The first radio sets his race had built were now fossilized in strata a thousand million years old. Man, who had possessed electrical machines for only a few centuries, could not compete with those who had known them for half the lifetime of the Earth. Nevertheless, the party kept their recorders running as they explored the building. There was still one problem to be solved. The deserted station was broadcasting programs, but where were they coming from? The central switchboard had been quickly located, 
It was designed to handle scores of programs simultaneously, but the source of those programs was lost in a maze of cables that vanished underground. Back in the S-9000, Rugon was trying to analyze the broadcasts, and perhaps his researches would reveal their origin. It was impossible to trace cables that might lead across continents. The party wasted little time at the deserted station. There was nothing they could learn from it, and they were seeking life rather than scientific information. A few minutes later, the little ship rose swiftly from the plateau and headed toward the plains that must lie beyond the mountains. Less than three hours were still left to them. As the array of enigmatic mirrors dropped out of sight, Rostron was struck by a sudden thought. Was it imagination? Or had they all moved a small angle while he had been waiting, as if they were still compensating for the rotation of the earth? He could not be sure, and he dismissed the matter as unimportant. It would only mean that the directing mechanism was still working, after a fashion. They discovered the city, fifteen minutes later. It was a great, sprawling metropolis, built around a river that had disappeared, leaving an ugly scar winding its way among the great buildings and beneath bridges that looked very incongruous now. Even from the air, the city looked deserted. But only two and a half hours were left, there was no time for further exploration. Orostron made his decision and landed near the largest structure he could see. It seemed reasonable to suppose that some creatures would have sought shelter in the strongest buildings, where they would be safe until the very end. The deepest caves, the heart of the planet itself, would give no protection when the final cataclysm came. Even if this race had reached the outer planets, its doom would only be delayed by the few hours it would take for the ravening wave fronts to cross the solar system. Arostron could not know that the city had been deserted not for a few days or weeks, but for over a century. For the culture of cities, which had outlasted so many civilizations, had been doomed at last when the helicopter brought universal transportation. Within a few generations, the great masses of mankind, knowing that they could reach any part of the globe in a matter of hours, had gone back to the fields and forests for which they had always longed. The new civilization had machines and resources of which earlier ages had never dreamed, but it was essentially rural and no longer bound to the steel and concrete warrens that had dominated the centuries before. Such cities as still remained were specialized centers of research, administration, or entertainment. The others had been allowed to decay, where it was too much trouble to destroy them. The dozen or so greatest of all cities and the ancient university towns had scarcely changed and would have lasted for many generations to come. But the cities that had been founded on steam and iron and surface transportation had passed with the industries that had nourished them. And so while Arostron waited in the tender, his colleagues raced through endless empty corridors and deserted halls, taking innumerable photographs but learning nothing of the creatures who had used these buildings. There were libraries, meeting places, council rooms, thousands of offices. All were empty and deep with dust. If they had not seen a radio station on its mountain area, the explorers could well have believed that this world had known no life for centuries. Through the long minutes of waiting, Arostron tried to imagine where this race could have vanished. Perhaps they had killed themselves, knowing that escape was impossible. Perhaps they had built great shelters in the bowels of the planet, and even now were cowering in their millions beneath his feet, waiting for the end. He began to fear that he would never know. It was almost a relief when at last he had to give the order for the return. Soon he would know if Torquilly's party had been more fortunate, and he was anxious to get back to the mother ship, for as the minutes passed, the suspense had become more and more acute. There had always been the thought in his mind, what if the astronomers of Kulath have made a mistake. He would begin to feel happy when the walls of the S-9000 were around him.
He would be happier still when they were out in space and this ominous sun was shrinking far astern. As soon as his colleagues had entered the airlock, Arostran hurled his tiny machine into the sky and set the controls to home on S-9000. Then he turned to his friends. Well, what have you found? he asked. Clarton produced a large roll of canvas and spread it out on the floor. This is what they were like, he said quietly. Bipeds with only two arms. They seem to have managed well in spite of that handicap. Only two eyes as well, unless there are others in the back. We were lucky to find this. It's about the only thing they left behind. The ancient oil painting stared stonily back at the three creatures regarding it so intently. By the irony of fate, its complete worthlessness had saved it from oblivion. When the city had been evacuated, no one had bothered to move Alderman John Richards, 1909 to 1974. For a century and a half, he had been gathering dust while far away from the old cities. The new civilization had been rising to heights no earlier culture had ever known. That was almost all we found, said Clarton. The city must have been deserted for years. I'm afraid our expedition has been a failure. If there are any living beings on this world, they've hidden themselves too well for us to find them. His commander was forced to agree. It was an almost impossible task, he said. If we'd had weeks instead of hours, we might have succeeded. For all we know, they may even have built shelters under the sea. No one seems to have thought of that. He glanced quickly at the indicators and corrected the course. We'll be there in five minutes. Alvaron seems to be moving rather quickly. I wonder if Torkley has found anything. The S-9000 was hanging a few miles above the seaboard of a blazing continent when Arostran homed upon it. The danger line was thirty minutes away and there was no time to lose. Skillfully, he maneuvered the little ship into its launching tube, and the party stepped out of the airlock. There was a small crowd waiting for them. That was to be expected, but Arostran could see at once that something more than curiosity had brought his friends here. Even before a word was spoken, he knew that something was wrong. Torkali hasn't returned. He's lost his party, and we're going to the rescue. Come along to the control room at once. From the beginning, Torkali had been luckier than Arostran. He had followed the zone of twilight, keeping away from the intolerable glare of the sun, until he came to the shores of an inland sea. It was a very recent sea, one of the latest of man's works, for the land it covered had been desert less than a century before. In a few hours, it would be desert again, for the water was boiling and clouds of steam were rising to the skies but they could not veil the loveliness of the great white city that overlooked the tideless sea. Flying machines were still parked neatly round the square in which Torkali landed. They were disappointingly primitive, though beautifully finished, and depended on rotating airfoils for support. Nowhere was there any sign of life, but the place gave the impression that its inhabitants were not very far away. Lights were still shining from some of the windows. Torkali's three companions lost no time in leaving the machine. Leader of the party by seniority of rank and race was Tassinadri, who, like Alvaron himself, had been born on one of the ancient planets of the central suns. Next came Alarcane, from a race which was one of the youngest in the universe, and took a perverse pride in the fact. Last came one of the strange beings from the system of Palador. It was nameless, like all its kind, for it possessed no identity of its own, being merely a mobile but still dependent cell in the consciousness of its race. Though it and its fellows had long been scattered over the galaxy in the exploration of countless worlds, some unknown link still bound them together, as inexorably as the living cells in a human body. When a creature of Palador spoke, the pronoun it used was always we. There was not, nor could there ever be, any first-person singular in the language of Palador. 
the great doors of the splendid building baffled the explorers, though any human child would have known their secret. Synodry wasted no time on them, but called Torkoli on his personal transmitter. Then the three hurried aside while their commander maneuvered his machine into the best position. There was a brief burst of intolerable flame. The massive steelwork flickered once at the edge of the visible spectrum and was gone. The stones were still glowing when the eager party hurried into the building, the beams of their light projectors fanning before them. The torches were not needed. Before them lay a great hall, glowing with light from lines of tubes along the ceiling. On either side, the hall opened out into long corridors, while straight ahead, a massive stairway swept majestically toward the upper floors. For a moment, Synodry hesitated. Then, since one way was as good as another, he led his companions down the first corridor. The feeling that life was near had now become very strong. At any moment, it seemed, they might be confronted by the creatures of this world. If they showed hostility, and they could scarcely be blamed if they did, the paralyzers would be used at once. The tension was very great as the party entered the first room and only relaxed when they saw that it held nothing but machines, row after row of them, now stilled and silent. Lining the enormous room were thousands of metal filing cabinets, forming a continuous wall as far as the eye could reach. And that was all. There was no furniture, nothing but the cabinets and the mysterious machines. Allercain, always the quickest of the three, was already examining the cabinets. Each held many thousand sheets of tough, thin material, perforated with innumerable holes and slots. The Paladorian appropriated one of the cards, and Allercane recorded the scene together with some close-ups of the machines. Then they left. The great room, which had been one of the marvels of the world, meant nothing to them. No living eye would ever again see that wonderful battery of almost human Hollerith analyzers and the five thousand million punched cards holding all that could be recorded of each man, woman, and child on the planet. It was clear that this building had been used very recently. With growing excitement, the explorers hurried onto the next room. This they found to be an enormous library, for millions of books lay all around them on miles and miles of shelving. Here, though the explorers could not know it, were the records of all the laws that man had ever passed, and all the speeches that had ever been made in his council chambers. Synodry was deciding his plan of action when Allercain drew his attention to one of the racks a hundred yards away. It was half empty, unlike all the others. Around it, books lay in a tumbled heap on the floor, as if knocked down by someone in frantic haste. The signs were unmistakable. Not long ago, other creatures had been this way. Faint wheel marks were clearly visible on the floor to the acute sense of Allercane, though the others could see nothing. Allercane could even detect footprints, but knowing nothing of the creatures that had formed them, he could not say which way they led. The sense of nearness was stronger than ever now, but it was nearness in time, not in space. Allercane voiced the thoughts of the party. Those books must have been very valuable, and someone has come to rescue them. Rather as an afterthought, I should say. That means there must be a place of refuge, possibly not very far away. Perhaps we may be able to find some other clues that will lead us to it. Synodry agreed. The Paladorian wasn't enthusiastic. That may be so, it said, but the refuge may be anywhere on the planet, and we have just two hours left. Let us waste no more time if we hope to rescue these people. The party hurried forward once more, pausing only to collect a few books that might be useful to the scientists at base, though it was doubtful if they could ever be translated. They soon found that the great building was composed largely of small rooms, all showing signs of recent occupation. 
Most of them were in a neat and tidy condition, but one or two were very much the reverse. The explorers were particularly puzzled by one room, clearly an office of some kind, that appeared to have been completely wrecked. The floor was littered with papers, the furniture had been smashed, and smoke was pouring through the broken windows from the fires outside. Synodry was rather alarmed. Surely no dangerous animal could have gotten to a place like this, he exclaimed, fingering his paralyzer nervously. Alaking did not answer. He began to make that annoying sound which his race called laughter. It was several minutes before he would explain what had amused him. I don't think any animal has done it, he said. In fact, the explanation is very simple. Suppose you had been working all your life in this room, dealing with endless papers year after year, and suddenly you were told that you will never see it again, that your work is finished, and that you can leave it forever. More than that, no one will come after you. Everything is finished. How would you make your exit, Synodry? The other thought for a moment. Well, I suppose I'd just tidy things up and leave. That's what seems to have happened in all the other rooms. Alarcane laughed again. I'm quite sure you would, but some individuals have a different psychology. I think I should have liked the creature that used this room. He did not explain himself further, and his two colleagues puzzled over his words for quite a while before they gave it up. It came as something of a shock when Torkeli gave the order to return. They had gathered a great deal of information, but had found no clue that might lead them to the missing inhabitants of this world. That problem was as baffling as ever, and now it seemed that it would never be solved. There were only 40 minutes left before the S-9000 would be departing. They were halfway back to the tender when they saw the semicircular passage leading down into the depths of the building. Its architectural style was quite different from that used elsewhere, and the gently sloping floor was an irresistible attraction to creatures whose many legs had grown weary of the marble staircases, which only bipeds could have built in such profusion. Synodry had been the worst sufferer, for he normally employed twelve legs and could use twenty when he was in a hurry, though no one had ever seen him perform this feat. The party stopped dead and looked down the passageway with a single thought. A tunnel leading down into the depths of earth. At its end they might yet find the people of this world and rescue some of them from their fate for there was still time to call the mother ship if the need arose. Synodry signaled to his commander, and Torkeli brought the little machine immediately overhead. There might not be time for the party to retrace its footsteps through the maze of passages so meticulously recorded in the Paladorian mind that there was no possibility of going astray. If speed was necessary, Torkeli could blast his way through the dozen floors above their head. In any case, it should not take long to find what lay at the end of the passage. It took only thirty seconds. The tunnel ended quite abruptly in a very curious cylindrical room with magnificently padded seats along the walls. There was no way out save that by which they had come, and it was several seconds before the purpose of the chamber dawned on Alarcane's mind. It was a pity, he thought, that they would never have time to use this. The thought was suddenly interrupted by a cry from Synodry. Alarcane wheeled around and saw that the entrance had closed silently behind them. Even in that first moment of panic, Alarcane found himself thinking with some admiration. Whoever they were, they knew how to build automatic machinery. The Paladorian was the first to speak. It waved one of its tentacles toward the seats. We think... It would be best to be seated, it said. The multiplex mind of Palador had already analyzed the situation and knew what was coming. They did not have long to wait before a low-pitched hum came from a grill overhead, 
And for the very last time in history, a human, even if lifeless, voice was heard on Earth. The words were meaningless, though the trapped explorers could guess their message clearly enough. Choose your stations, please, and be seated. Simultaneously, a wall panel at one end of the compartment glowed with light. On it was a simple map, consisting of a series of a dozen circles connected by a line. Each of the circles had writing alongside it, and beside the writing were two buttons of different colors. Alarcane looked questioningly at his leader. Don't touch them, said Synodry. If we leave the controls alone, the doors may open again. He was wrong. The engineers who had designed the automatic subway had assumed that anyone who entered it would naturally wish to go somewhere. If they selected no intermediate station, their destination could only be the end of the line. There was another pause while the relays and the thyrotrons waited for their orders. In those thirty seconds, if they had known what to do, the party could have opened the doors and left the subway. But they did not know, and the machines geared to a human psychology acted for them. The surge of acceleration was not very great. The lavish upholstery was a luxury, not a necessity. Only an almost imperceptible vibration told of the speed at which they were traveling through the bowels of the earth, on a journey the duration of which they could not even guess. And in thirty minutes, the S-9000 would be leaving the solar system. There was a long silence in the speeding machine. Synodry and Alarcane were thinking rapidly. So was the Paladorian, though in a different fashion. The conception of personal death was meaningless to it, for the destruction of a single unit meant no more to the group mind than the loss of a nail paring to a man. But it could, though with great difficulty, appreciate the plight of individual intelligence such as Alarcane and Synodry, and it was anxious to help them if it could. Alarcane had managed to contact Torkali with his personal transmitter, though the signal was very weak and seemed to be fading quickly. Rapidly he explained the situation, and almost at once the signals became clearer. Torkali was following the path of the machine, flying toward their unknown destination. That was the first indicator they had of the fact that they were traveling at nearly a thousand miles an hour, and very soon after that Torkali was able to give the still more disturbing news that they were rapidly approaching the sea. While they were beneath the land there was a hope though a slender one, that they might stop the machine and escape. But under the ocean, not all the brains and the machinery in the great mothership could save them. No one could have devised a more perfect trap. Synodry had been examining the wall map with great attention. Its meaning was obvious, and along the line connecting the circles a tiny spot of light was crawling. It was already halfway to the first of the stations marked. I'm going to press one of those buttons, said Synodry at last. It won't do any harm, and we may learn something. I agree. Which will you try first? There are only two kinds, and it won't matter if we try the wrong one first. I suppose one is to start the machine, and the other is to stop it. Alarcane was not very hopeful. It started without any button pressing, he said. I think it's completely automatic, and we can't control it from here at all. Synodry could not agree. These buttons are clearly associated with the stations, and there's no point in having them unless you can use them to stop yourself. The only question is, which is the right one? His analysis was perfectly correct. The machine could be stopped at any intermediate station. They had only been on their way ten minutes, and if they could leave now, no harm would have been done. It was just bad luck that Synodry's first choice was the wrong button. The little light on the map crawled slowly through the illuminated circle without checking its speed, and at the same time, Torkali called from the ship overhead. You have just passed underneath a city and are heading out to sea. There cannot be another stop for nearly a thousand miles. Alvaron had given up all hope of finding life on this world. 
the S-9000 had roamed over half the planet, never staying long in one place, descending ever and again in an effort to attract attention. There had been no response. Earth seemed utterly dead. If any of its inhabitants were still alive, thought Alvaron, they must have hidden themselves in its depths where no help could reach them, though their doom would be nonetheless certain. Rugon brought news of the disaster. The great ship ceased its fruitless searching and fled back through the storm to the ocean above which Torkali's little tender was still following the track of the buried machine. The scene was truly terrifying. Not since the days when Earth was born had there been such seas as this. Mountains of water were racing before the storm which had now reached velocities of many hundred miles an hour. Even at this distance from the mainland, the air was full of flying debris. Trees, fragments of houses, sheets of metal, anything that had not been anchored to the ground. No airborne machine could have lived for a moment in such a gale. And ever and again, even the roar of the wind was drowned as the vast water mountains met head on with a crash that seemed to shake the sky. Fortunately, there had been no serious earthquakes yet. Far beneath the bed of the ocean, the wonderful piece of engineering which had been the world president's private vacuum subway was still working perfectly, unaffected by the tumult and destruction above. It would continue to work until the last minute of the Earth's existence, which, if the astronomers were right, was not much more than 15 minutes away, though precisely how much more Alvaron would have given a great deal to know. It would be nearly an hour before the trapped party could reach land and even the slightest hope of rescue. Alvaron's instructions had been precise, though even without them he would never have dreamed of taking any risks with the great machine that had been entrusted to his care. Had he been human, the decision to abandon the trapped members of his crew would have been desperately hard to make. But he came of a race far more sensitive than man a race that so loved the things of the spirit that long ago, and with infinite reluctance, it had taken over control of the universe, since only thus could it be sure that justice was being done. Alvaron would need all his superhuman gifts to carry him through the next few hours. Meanwhile, a mile below the bed of the ocean, Alarcane and Synodry were very busy indeed with their private communicators, Fifteen minutes is not a long time in which to wind up the affairs of a lifetime. It is indeed scarcely long enough to dictate more than a few of those farewell messages which at such moments are so much more important than all other matters. All the while the Paladorian had remained silent and motionless, saying not a word. The other two, resigned to their fate and engrossed in their personal affairs, had given it no thought. They were startled when suddenly it began to address them in its peculiarly passionless voice. We perceive that you are making certain arrangements concerning your anticipated destruction. That will probably be unnecessary. Captain Alvron hopes to rescue us if we can stop this machine when we reach land again. Both Synodry and Alarcane were too surprised to say anything for a moment. Then the latter gasped, How do you know? It was a foolish question, for he remembered at once that there were several Paladorians, if one could use the phrase, in the S-9000, and consequently their companion knew everything that was happening in the mother ship. So he did not wait for an answer, but continued, Alvron can't do that. He daren't take such a risk. There will be no risk, said the Paladorian. We have told him what to do. It is really very simple. Alarcane and Synodry looked at their companion with something approaching awe, realizing now what must have happened. In moments of crisis, the single units comprising the Paladorian mind could link together in an organization no less close than that of any physical brain. At such moments, they formed an intellect more powerful than any other in the universe. All ordinary problems could be solved by a few hundred or thousand units, very rarely millions would be needed, and on two historic occasions the billions of cells of the entire Paladorian consciousness had been welded together to deal with emergencies that threatened the race.
The mind of Palador was one of the greatest mental resources of the universe. Its full force was seldom required, but the knowledge that it was available was supremely comforting to other races. Alarcain wondered how many cells had coordinated to deal with this particular emergency. He also wondered how so trivial an incident had ever come to its attention. To that question he was never to know the answer, though he might have guessed it had he known that the chillingly remote Palidorian mind possessed an almost human streak of vanity. Long ago, Alarcain had written a book trying to prove that eventually all intelligent races would sacrifice individual consciousness and that one day only group minds would remain in the universe. Palador, he had said, was the first of those ultimate intellects, and the vast, dispersed mind had not been displeased. They had no time to ask any further questions before Alvaron himself began to speak through their communicators. Alvaron calling. We're staying on this planet until the detonation waves reach it, so we may be able to rescue you. You're heading toward a city on the coast which you'll reach in 40 minutes at your present speed. If you cannot stop yourselves then, we're going to blast the tunnel behind and ahead of you to cut off your power. Then we'll sink a shaft to get you out. The chief engineer says he can do it in five minutes with the main projectors. So you should be safe within an hour, unless the sun blows up before. And if that happens, you'll be destroyed as well. You mustn't take such a risk. Don't let that worry you. We're perfectly safe. When the sun detonates, the explosion wave will take several minutes to rise to its maximum. But apart from that, we're on the night side of the planet, behind an 8,000-mile screen of rock. When the first warning of the explosion comes, we will accelerate out of the solar system, keeping in the shadow of the planet. Under our maximum drive, we will reach the velocity of light before leaving the cone of shadow, and the sun cannot harm us then. Synodry was still afraid to hope. Another objection came at once into his mind. Yes, but how will you get any warning here on the night side of the planet? Very easily, replied Alvaron. This world has a moon which is now visible from this hemisphere. We have telescopes trained on it. If it shows any sudden increase in brilliance, our main drive goes on automatically and will be thrown out of the system. The logic was flawless. Alvaron, cautious as ever, was taking no chances. It would be many minutes before the 8,000-mile shield of rock and metal could be destroyed by the fires of the exploding sun. In that time, the S-9000 could have reached the safety of the velocity of light. Alarcane pressed the second button when they were still several miles from the coast. He did not expect anything to happen then, assuming that the machine could not stop between stations. It seemed too good to be true when a few minutes later the machine's slight vibration died away and they came to a halt. The doors slid silently apart. Even before they were fully open, the three had left the compartment. They were taking no more chances. Before them, a long tunnel stretched into the distance, rising slowly out of sight. They were starting along it when suddenly Alvaron's voice called from the communicators. Stay where you are. We're going to blast. The ground shuddered once, and far ahead there came the rumble of falling rock. Again the earth shook, and a hundred yards ahead the passageway vanished abruptly. A tremendous vertical shaft had been cut clean through it. The party hurried forward again until they came to the end of the corridor and stood waiting on its lip. The shaft in which it ended was a full thousand feet across and descended into the earth as far as the torches could throw their beams. Overhead, the storm clouds fled beneath a moon that no man would have recognized, so luridly brilliant was its disk. And most glorious of all sights, the S-9000 floated high above, the great projectors that had drilled this enormous pit still glowing cherry red. A dark shape detached itself from the mother ship and dropped swiftly towards the ground. Torkali was returning to collect his friends. A little later, Alvaron greeted them in the control room. He waved to the great vision screen and said quietly, See, 
We were barely in time. The continent below them was slowly settling beneath the mile-high waves that were attacking its coasts. The last that anyone was ever to see of Earth was a great plain, bathed with the silver light of the abnormally brilliant moon. Across its face, the waters were pouring in a glittering flood toward a distant range of mountains. The sea had won its final victory, but its triumph would be short-lived, for soon sea and land would be no more. Even as the silent party in the control room watched the destruction below, the infinitely greater catastrophe to which this was only the prelude came swiftly upon them. It was as though dawn had broken suddenly over this moonlit landscape. But it was not dawn. It was only the moon shining with the brilliance of a second sun. For perhaps thirty seconds that awesome, unnatural light burnt fiercely on the doomed land beneath. Then there came a sudden flashing of indicator lights across the control board. The main drive was on. For a second, Alvaron glanced at the indicators and checked their information. When he looked again at the screen, Earth was gone. The magnificent, desperately overstrained generators quietly died when the S-9000 was passing the orbit of Persephone. It did not matter. The sun could never harm them now, and although the ship was speeding helplessly out into the lonely night of interstellar space, it would only be a matter of days before rescue came. There was irony in that. A day ago, they had been the rescuers, going to the aid of a race that now no longer existed. Not for the first time, Alvaron wondered about the world that had just perished. He tried in vain to picture it as it had been in its glory. The streets of its cities thronged with life, Primitive though its people had been, they might have offered much to the universe. If only they could have made contact. Regret was useless. Long before their coming, the people of this world must have buried themselves in its iron heart. And now they and their civilization would remain a mystery for the rest of time. Alvaron was glad when his thoughts were interrupted by Rugon's entrance. The chief of communications had been very busy ever since the takeoff, trying to analyze the programs radiated by the transmitter Arostron had discovered. The problem was not a difficult one, but it demanded the construction of special equipment, and that had taken time. Well, what have you found? asked Alvaron. Quite a lot, replied his friend. There's something mysterious here, and I don't understand it. It didn't take long to find how the vision transmissions were built up, and we've been able to convert them to suit our own equipment. It seems that there were cameras all over the planet, surveying points of interest. Some of them were apparently in cities on the tops of very high buildings. The cameras were rotating continuously to give panoramic views. In the programs we've recorded, there are about... 20 different scenes. In addition, there are a number of transmissions of a different kind, neither sound nor vision. They seem to be purely scientific, possibly instrument readings or something of that sort. All these programs were going out simultaneously on different frequency bands. Now there must be a reason for all this. Arostron still thinks that the station simply wasn't switched off when it was deserted, that these aren't the sort of programs such a station would normally radiate at all. It was certainly used for interplanetary relaying. Clarton was quite right there. So these people must have crossed space, since none of the other planets had any life at the time of the last survey. Don't you agree? Alvaron was following intently. Yes, that seems reasonable enough. But it's also certain that the beam was pointing to none of the other planets. I checked that myself. I know, said Rugon. What I want to discover is why a giant interplanetary relay station is busily transmitting pictures of a world about to be destroyed. Pictures that would be of immense interest to scientists and astronomers. <laughs> 
Someone had gone to a lot of trouble to arrange all those panoramic cameras. I am convinced that those beams were going somewhere. Alvaron started up. Do you imagine that there might be an outer planet that hasn't been reported? He asked. If so, your theory's certainly wrong. The beam wasn't even pointing in the plane of the solar system. And even if it were, just look at this. He switched on the vision screen and adjusted the controls. Against the velvet curtain of space was hanging a blue-white sphere, apparently composed of many concentric shells of incandescent gas. Even though its immense distance made all movement invisible, it was clearly expanding at an enormous rate. At its center was a blinding point of light, the white dwarf star that the sun had now become. You probably don't realize just how big that sphere is, said Alvaron. Look at this. He increased the magnification until only the center portion of the nova was visible. Close to its heart were two minute condensations, one on either side of the nucleus. Those are the two giant planets of the system. They've still managed to retain their existence after a fashion. And they were several hundred million miles from the sun. The nova is still expanding, but it's already twice the size of the solar system. Rugan was silent for a moment. Perhaps you're right, he said, rather grudgingly. You've disposed of my first theory, but you still haven't satisfied me. He made several swift circuits of the room before speaking again. Alvron waited patiently. He knew the almost intuitive powers of his friend, who could often solve a problem when mere logic seemed insufficient. Then, rather slowly, Rugon began to speak again. What do you think of this, he said. Suppose we've completely underestimated this people. Rostron did it once. He thought they could never have crossed space since they'd only known radio for two centuries. Hanser, too, told me that. Well, Rostron was quite wrong. Perhaps we're all wrong. I've had a look at the material that Clarton brought back from the transmitter. He wasn't impressed by what he found, but it's a marvelous achievement for so short a time. There were devices in that station that belonged to civilizations thousands of years older. Alvaron, can we follow that beam to see where it leads? Alvaron said nothing for a full minute. He had been more than half expecting the question, but it was not an easy one to answer. The main generators had gone completely. There was no point in trying to repair them. But there was still power available, and while there was power, anything could be done in time. It would mean a lot of improvisation and some difficult maneuvers, for the ship still had its enormous initial velocity. Yes, it could be done, and the activity would keep the crew from becoming further depressed, now that the reaction caused by the mission's failure had started to set in. The news that the nearest heavy repair ship could not reach them for three weeks had also caused a slump in morale. The engineers, as usual, made a tremendous fuss. Again, as usual, they did the job in half the time they had dismissed as being absolutely impossible. Very slowly, over many hours, the great ship began to discard the speed its main drive had given it in as many minutes. In a tremendous curve, Millions of miles in radius, the S-9000 changed its course and the star fields shifted round it. The maneuver took three days, but at the end of that time the ship was limping along a course parallel to the beam that had once come from Earth. They were heading out into emptiness, the blazing sphere that had been the sun dwindling slowly behind them. By the standards of interstellar flight, they were almost stationary. For hours, Rugon strained over his instruments, driving his detector beams far ahead into space. There were certainly no planets within many light years. There was no doubt of that. From time to time, Alvaron came to see him, and always he had to give the same reply. Nothing to report. <laughs>
About a fifth of the time, Rugon's intuition let him down badly. He began to wonder if this was such an occasion. Not until a week later did the needles of the mass detectors quiver feebly at the ends of their scales. But Rugon said nothing, not even to his captain. He waited until he was sure, and he went on waiting until even the short-range scanners began to react and to build up the first faint pictures on the vision screen. Still, he waited patiently until he could interpret the images. Then, when he knew that his wildest fancy was even less than the truth, he called his colleagues into the control room. The picture on the vision screen was the familiar one of endless star fields, sun beyond sun to the very limits of the universe. Near the center of the screen, a distant nebula made a patch of haze that was difficult for the eye to grasp. Rugon increased the magnification. The stars flowed out of the field. The little nebula expanded until it filled the screen, and then it was a nebula no longer. A simultaneous gasp of amazement came from all the company at the sight that lay before them. Lying across league after league of space, ranged in a vast three-dimensional array of rows and columns with the precision of a marching army, were thousands of tiny pencils of light. They were moving swiftly, the whole immense lattice holding its shape as a single unit. Even as Alvaron and his comrades watched, the formation began to drift off the screen and Rugon had to recenter the controls. After a long pause, Rugon started to speak. This is the race, he said softly, that has known radio for only two centuries. The race that we believed had crept to die in the heart of its planet. I have examined those images under the highest possible magnification that is the greatest fleet of which there has ever been a record. Each of those points of light represents a ship larger than our own. Of course, they are very primitive. What you see on the screen are the jets of their rockets. Yes, they dared to use rockets to bridge interstellar space. You realize what that means. It would take them centuries to reach the nearest star. The whole race must have embarked on this journey in the hope that its descendants would complete it generations later. To measure the extent of their accomplishment, think of the ages it took us to conquer space, and the longer ages still before we attempted to reach the stars. Even if we were threatened with annihilation, could we have done so much in so short a time? Remember, this is the youngest civilization in the universe. 400,000 years ago, it did not even exist. What will it be a million years from now? An hour later, Arostron left the crippled mothership to make contact with the great fleet ahead. As the little torpedo disappeared among the stars, Alvaron turned to his friend and made a remark that Rugon was often to remember in the years ahead. I wonder what they'll be like, he mused. Will they be nothing but wonderful engineers with no art or philosophy? They're going to have such a surprise when Arostron reaches them. I expect it will be rather a blow to their pride. It's funny how all isolated races think they're the only people in the universe. But they should be grateful to us. We're going to save them a good many hundred years of travel. Alvaron glanced at the Milky Way, lying like a veil of silver mist across the vision screen. He waved toward it with a sweep of a tentacle that embraced the whole circle of the galaxy, from the central planets to the lonely suns of the rim. You know... He said to Rugon, I feel rather afraid of these people. Suppose they don't like our little federation. <laughs>
He waved once more toward the star clouds that lay massed across the screen, glowing with the light of their countless suns. Something tells me they'll be very determined people, he added. We had better be polite to them. After all, we only outnumber them about a thousand million to one. Rugon laughed at his captain's little joke. Twenty years afterward, the remark didn't seem funny. <laughs>